folks, a very warm welcome to the launch of the University of Limerick's Universal Design for Learning Community of Practice. We're absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today, um, particularly our own community um, who will contribute here at the University of Limerick, but to those who are joining us from across the country, the UK and as far as Australia. I hope that you've managed to stay awake so late into the evening and thank you for joining us. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Sean Bracken, who will be our keynote today, and Thomas will introduce Sean in a couple of moments. I would like to acknowledge the funding from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning um, and the vital funding, which is supporting today's event, but also the setup of our platform for our community of practice and the development of some of the initial resources for this. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight into how all of this began, um, a number of colleagues here at the University of Limerick over the last two years have participated in the National Forums and AHEAD's um, digital badge on universal design for learning. And we came together, a group of us who are peer facilitators this week came together, or this year came together, <laughs> looking to see how we can continue the conversation on you, you know, developing our practice now that we've engaged with the digital badge. Um, so um, our steering group, just to briefly introduce you, um, my name is Ido Sullivan and I work in the Centre for Transformative Learning and I'm joined on the steering group by my colleague Angelica Risquez, um, David Maloney, Jess Beely, Lydia Bracken, um, Pauline Boland, Sinead Wall and Thomas Sushaknessy. And we'll initially just guide the setup of the community of practice that we hope that people will join us, experienced practitioners, very new practitioners, so that we all can contribute and learn from one another's experience in order to make and enhance a more inclusive experience for our students. Um, the notion of the COP or the community of practice is very much based on, you know, small beginnings and introducing small changes into our practice and eventually and developing, you know, more inclusive practices. Um, Jess is going to share with you there the link to join our community of practice. Um, and if you haven't already joined, you are very welcome to do that. And you also have there um, the link to our website which Jess will introduce you to a little bit later. So I will pass over now to um, Thomas, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thanks, Ida. As Ida said, we're delighted today to have Dr. Sean Bracken with us. He's a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He's worked as a teacher, a teacher educator, a lecturer, and an educational project manager in a diversity of settings and jurisdictions, including Samoa, the USA, Ireland, Tonga, and in the last 11 years, it's in the United Kingdom. He's also a principal lecturer in the University of Worcester. He is the course coordinator for the National Award Senko. Sean is a national and international advocate for the university, uh, for universal design for learning, and is a co-founder of INCLUDE, which is the International Collaboratory for Leadership in Universal Designed Education, which seeks to advance uh, UN's sustainable development goals while strengthening access, participation, and outcomes for marginalized learners. Sean is also a con convener for an, an active inter interdisciplinary research group at the University of Worcester titled Inclusion by Design. He's also the co-leader, a uh, co-editor, I should say, of a fantastic book titled Transformative Higher Education through Universal Design for Learning and International Perspective. So I guess without further ado, I'm delighted to pass you over to Sean, who I'm sure will have a very engaging presentation for us. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Tomas, and um, very lovely to meet everybody virtually today. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do in the first instance is just to, to share my slides with you. And, uh, and I expect I'll probably hear from Tracy Galvin shortly telling me how to do this. <laughs> Sorry about this now, just. Sorry, guys. I feel a little bit like um, Boris Johnson during the week, I have to say. I'll go back into sharing. And um, I suppose it's. Uh, it's 
it's no harm you're having an insight into this. Uh, if I, if I, is that all right? And I'll, I'll maximize it just in a moment. So you're on it there. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. OK, good stuff. So, um, yeah, I just just to once again to share with you the fact that, um, that just to welcome you to to this event, a really exciting event for the University of Limerick and for the colleagues that have been identified who are part of the steering committee, in addition to everybody else who's going to participate in what I'm sure is going to be just a really well worthwhile engagement. So the, the title that I have for you is Developing UDL Professional Learning Communities to Enhance Cross-Campus Inclusion. So in terms of the aims for today, um, I thought it'd be good to, to identify three aims. In the first instance, we'll, we'll look at this in terms of action-oriented aims, and they are to identify, apply, and extend. In the first instance, to identify a rationale and values underpinning development of a vibrant UDL professional learning community. Secondly, to apply core concepts of universal design, along with insights from joint practice development. Um, that's Michael Fielding's work on joint practice development and using also the notion of communities of practice to guide the development of a sustainable uh, research, learning and praxis community. And I have purposefully put the word praxis in there uh, because it's um, it for me it it hits on that notion again of reflection, self reflection, community reflection, and action. And I think that those phrases sit really well with the the overarching framework of the Universal Design for Learning guidelines. And then to extend and think about the network of colleagues engaged with inclusive learning, teaching, and assessment to strengthen a research base of practice and also to extend your, your um, community of practice, perhaps more nationally and internationally as well. So just to start off the, the session, what I'd like to do is to provide you with some guiding conceptual frameworks and a background. Uh, and then we'll go into kind of three steps that I think are going to be helpful for you to reflect upon as you develop your community of practice. So the conceptual framework underpinning this, underpinning the universal design for learning guidelines. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work of Ron Mace, who is an architect uh, working out of the University, uh, State University of North Carolina. And uh, Ron was uh, perturbed, I suppose, by the fact that the environment in which he lived and worked and learned wasn't very conducive to accessibility and set about changing mindsets in the um, architectural community and the designer community to think about space and how space could be designed more effectively and more inclusively. And that kind of concept then spread to the, the use of tools and how we use IT, for example, and how we can design IT to be more accessible and usable by the greatest number of people possible without having the necessity to retrofit, which is always hugely expensive and inconvenient, both for users and for designers. So it's best to anticipate what uh, designer use is going to be and then to design accordingly. So following on from the ideas put forward by Ron Mace, uh, we have the development of the UDL, the Universal Design for Learning Guidelines, which um, many of you will be familiar with, but I'm just going to briefly provide an overview in, rel in relation to the concepts of engagement, the why of learning, and its potential to influence and lead to purposeful and motivated learners. And I want you to think while we're looking at this, um, representation of the UDL guidelines to how this can actually be applied at a meta level in relation to your setting up of your community of practice. So how do you engage the, the participants that you will be involved in? How do you provide for multiple means of representation? What is it that you're expecting in terms of the what of your learning community? And how might that lead to 
a resourceful and knowledgeable group of uh, colleagues coming together. Now, when I say colleagues, I also want to use that sense in, in the widest uh, possible way of thinking about learners who are part of the community as well. And ultimately then providing uh, multiple means of action and expression. I identified at the outset that action is where it's at. So the necessity to for us to consider action and expression and how best we or you as a community can become strategic and goal directed in relation to your practices. So, so those are some of the underpinning principles. And then um, this can be complemented because when you reflect on the nature of universal design for learning, when it was designed, it was designed uh, as a result of the engagement of learning technologists, psychologists, uh, philosophers, lecturers, who to some extent were designing for children in uh, the Harvard University in the 1980s and early 1990s. So this community practice obviously involves adults and the framework itself, I think, has to consider the guidelines themselves has to consider how adults are considerably more agentive or have that potential to be active and uh, engaged participants and designers in their own learning. So uh, joining on the uh, on the work, as I mentioned, of Michael Fielding, it's it might be a good idea to pull in this concept of joint practice development, which it, which is a really fascinating insight, I think. It really enables people to, to rethink professional development. This concept was uh, raised here in, in the United Kingdom, as, as I mentioned, perhaps over the last 20 years, where there was a realization that having guest speakers like myself come in and deliver one-off sessions, professional development sessions, you generally inactive at your end, listening at this end, um, to change that dynamic and to think, how can we create groups of people who learn together within particular spaces? And in this context, obviously, it's it's you as colleagues and as students coming together uh, within the University of Limerick to develop your own uh, joint practice. And that involves interaction, mutual development to related practice. That practice is obviously learning, um, assessment design, curriculum design and higher education. It recognizes that each partner in the interaction has something to offer. And is, is that's based on the assumption of mutual beneficial learning. And it's research informed. And I think that's really, really important for you to perhaps keep in mind as you develop your community of practice, not only research informed, but that you I would encourage you to start generating new knowledge, new insights from your dynamic interactions as a community of practice and putting into into uh, into life this concept of joint practice development. So in terms of some of the insights that I'll be providing you with this morning, they're drawing on my own experiences as a convener for the inclusion by design research network which is based here at the University of Worcester There's, uh, 36 or so participants in that and also from the include uh, network the wider uh, international collaboratory for leadership and universally designed education and it's great to have some of the representatives from include here this morning including uh, Thomas actually uh, who's been a really vibrant member of that wider community so it's kind of how you might feed into and how you might learn from those wider networks as well. But we'll talk about that later on. So step one, identify the who and why. Um, so for us here at the University of Worcester, we have uh, what we call the, our inclusion toolkit. And it's great to have a university that has articulated how it would like practice to be developed and in relation to curriculum design, in relation to assessment design, and in relation to technological um, accessibility. However, when the rubber hits the road, it's a different thing. How does that happen? And I think it's important for colleagues to come together 
to be able to explore um, how policies and practices that generally uh, are put forward by universities, which say we are an inclusive university, but what does that mean and how is it evidence? So I think there's a necessity to explore um, those local policies and practices, also drawing on more international and national um, push factors in relation to uh, the necessity to adopt universal design for learning and for communities practice to reflect on how they may be implementing wider policies and legislation. And in this instance, I, I'm drawing on the UK law on web accessibility, which obviously uh, draws on wider European legislation as well. And then thinking about, um, as I mentioned, a kind of an international perspective, there's never been, I think, um, perhaps maybe in the 1970s, 1980s, as as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was being created. There's a vibrant sense of uh, the necessity for colleagues to come together across the world and to share practice and to share insights around how they were implementing emerging policies, transnational global policies. I, th I feel like we're almost at a similar time and that the necessity, I think, at this time is absolutely critical for colleagues across the world to come together. And what I would like you to do, uh, perhaps when you have um, access to these slides, is to pop on to uh, our action oriented values, which have a very transnational feel to them and which very much guide our practices as a community of practice, as a wider community of practice within INCLUDE. So step two, what is it uh, that we're going to do? What is it that you will are going to do as a community of practice? Um, and it's, it's thinking about those multiple means of representation. If we go back to the UDL framework, so how, how can they be applied? And uh, it was interesting to hear that you have already um, a wide network of colleagues within uni uh, the University of Limerick who have come together to identify as a steering group um, how you are going to orient the policies and practices of that group. So I think in terms of sustainability, you're already maybe two, three steps ahead, which is really fantastic. Um, just having that uh, dynamic interactive group who, who can share ideas and who can uh, create a sense of direction for the wider group. Um, I know this slide looks a little bit messy, but I think <laughs> it perhaps reflects best how um, communities of praxis or collaboratories operate. And to this extent, I'm also drawing on my insights from Inclusion by Design, which is the research group uh, that I head up at uh, the University of Worcester and thinking about who sits around the table at this community of practice. Um, there is a necessity um, and it's I'm not, this is not a pyramidal kind of a structure. Um, it's it's much flatter than that. I think what we see here is um, a distributive leadership model in relation to how effective communities of practice or collaboratories operate. So let's start um, right at the bottom of this uh, so that we can practice some of that kind of more flat um, concept of how a community of practice is going to operate effectively and we could start with student services. So uh, there are maybe about four of the colleagues within the inclusion by design network that come from student services. Um, some of them have actively participated in research projects using uh, particularly effective methods around how to develop communities of research practice uh, involves looking at, for example, um, action research, and I would suggest lesson study as well as, as effective means to interrogate practice and to co-develop practice, because that's what a community of praxis is about. How can we co-create uh, um, 
situations where uh, the learning outcomes are realized by absolutely everybody. Uh, so that's the ultimate uh, ultimate goal. And it, that goal is not to compromise on the quality of the expectations, but just to provide the strategies that enable learners to attain those uh, expectations. So it also invol involves library and information services, information technologists, learners, and I would suggest uh, for you within uh, UL to include the students union because the voice of the students union is really quite powerful within universities. So it's really, really helpful if you manage to get a representative from your student union to come on board who can uh, uh, amplify your message um, if there if there are representatives from the student union who are sitting on wider uh, policy development uh, committees within your university. Obviously academics and also thinking about your relationship and perhaps future relationship with external agencies or external organizations such as include and such as you've identified some of them earlier on, Thomas, thinking about AHEAD and thinking about other universities and other um, colleagues across the country. I think that's a it's a really uh, strategic way to think about developing your collaboratory as you move forward and your community of practice. And you'll see there in terms of the, the, the kind of messiness of the interactions um, that there are fluid and that they will develop over time and they'll develop according to particular interests that colleagues have who are part of the community of practice. And I think to some extent you have to let that be emergent and to let that be organic in terms of how th those interests develop over time. But I'll come back to that idea of specific interests later on. So what about indicating indicating and cataloging your impact. I think it's really important to think about this from the outset when you're developing a community of practice, particularly if you want to influence uh, wider university policies and practices. Um, providing uh, evidence of how you have engaged and impacted on uh, professional development of colleagues right across the university is pivotal to uh, to influencing um, wider policy considerations. So provided a, a sample group of seminars that took place as part of inclusion by design. And so Deborah Price, a colleague who who's a learning and teaching coordinator with the School of um, Sports and Exercise Science, Madeline George, who is a library and information te uh, technologist. Um, Elliot Green and Helen Bailey were all were student learners um, who were involved in a research project. So I think, again, this illustrates that uh, crossover of collaboration between different agents. It's not only about the academics, it has to involve much broader representation from across the university. And they focused upon uh, a liberatory reading uh, students as academic partners project. So they explored a consideration of identity, representation and inclusion in resource lists. And what they did was they developed a, a, um, a list of resources, library and information services resources that they perceived could broaden out concepts of post colonial thinking and acting within the university. So that focus again on action is really quite pivotal. And this one of the other sessions that we've had earlier on in the year was uh, showcasing the work of Professor Richard Woolley and Sharon Leslie Smith, colleagues of ours, who launched um, the EU um, Erasmus funded project on, called SCALE, which um, talks about how best to facilitate learning for a diversity of learners. So it kind of brought together the universal design for learning concept in addition to uh, more uh, specific approaches that might be taken with specific cohorts of learners. And then again, um, we have highlighted the impact of um, the inclusion by design network in publications. So I think it's helpful for you to maybe 
factor that into your planning. What is it that you that that, that interests the participants who are there, and uh, what types of publications would you like them to create as a result of their interactions? So when I say publications, it could, for example, include seminars. It, it could include blogs. So you have to think about where the participants are in terms of their research journeys and provide for um, a diversity of ways in which you can facilitate their interacting with that community of practice in the longer term. So step three and the final step is the extension of that learning and the extension of the impact of your community of practice um, within and beyond the University of Limerick. So the major questions I would ask is how does learning from learning and insight inform our curriculum? How does it inform learning and how does it inform assessment design? So just reflecting on this again in an interdisciplinary way. When I kind of included academics earlier on, um, I had perhaps been negligent in, in mentioning that those academics should come from a diversity of, of backgrounds. And it's interesting, I think, within our own university, I come from an education background, but perhaps the most active members of the Inclusion by Design Network are colleagues from health and nursing backgrounds. So um, some from kind of more mainstream scientific rather than the humanities. So be open to involving and inviting and encouraging colleagues from across the university to join your, your um, community of practice. And how might their and our interactions inform wider community experiences. So part of the social experiences, for example, as well. So thinking about estates, that was one of the groups that I neglected to perhaps to mention in that rather messy icon that I included earlier on, but thinking about people from estates and how how the estate is, the, the wider campus estate is accessible and how that has, an, has implications for, for student well-being. So again, thinking, how do you log your success and why is this important? Well, I'll give you an example, one example from one department who play a particularly active role within um, uh, the Inclusion by Design Network. They've led to uh, two learning teaching awards within the university, one team teaching award, two additional <laughs> awards, which are kind of nominal awards in relation to professional practice and also in relation to fellowship programs. So here um, uh, in the UK, we have uh, the UK PSF, which is the, um, the United uh, Kingdom framework for, for HEA fellowships. And I believe if it's not already in place in Ireland, that there are emerging moves to develop such frameworks in Ireland. So I think these types of communities of practice provide a great vehicle uh, for colleagues to be able to develop an evidential base for their claims on, on fellowships. An impact in terms of embedding into discipline teaching. So, for example, the work that's been done at the University of Worcester features significantly in the PG Cert in learning and teaching in higher education. It also features, I know, from library and information services in relation to how they engage and encourage inclusive practice right across the um, right across the campus. So I think what you have emerging then are multiple players that actually start to influence culture from the bottom up. But I wonder whether that's sufficient. And um, <laughs> in wondering so, you know that I think that it's not quite sufficient. So I think we also need to impact on on the wider uh, policy. Uh, context within our settings. And the more that that culture develops in organically, well, then the louder the voices become in terms of senior leadership and the senior leadership being influenced by the nature of what happens within communities of practice. And there's a capacity to move from your vision, which you have as a select group of colleagues, to one that is much more uh, implementable across the uh, across the 
uh, campus. And here I'm drawing on uh, Bird Stoller's work from 2019 from the University of Washington and, and how she uh, illustrates uh, kind of a linear approach from the development of your values to your articulation of those values to then the adoption of particular frameworks and then thinking how that's going to influence um, practices within the university. So when it talks about inputs, it's thinking about policies, about guidelines, about procedures, about uh, staff professional development, about collegiate support, mentoring and coaching that you might put in place for one another, supporting emerging researchers, that kinds of things. And I, I identified earlier on looking at those outputs and outcomes. So think about those as you're developing your processes, as you, you're moving on, have a sense as to what direction you're heading and then be able to illustrate the impact of what it is that you're doing so that um, that impact becomes much more visible across the campus and um, and as articulated by many, many different voices so that it's through that articulation becomes kind of a living culture of inclusion across the campus. So I think in terms of, well, perhaps just one more thing before we go to questions and discussion, what I would like to do is again, um, share with you some additional resources and references. I think the whole area around uh, communities of practice and professional learning communities is just fascinating. And it's great to read up a little bit on, on the research to inform yourselves around the, the foundations upon which you're going to de uh, develop what really will be a, a fabulous community, I'm sure. But also to draw your attention to the University of Limerick's Universal Design for Learning website, which features there just at the end of the um, of the resources available so that you can pop in and have a look at that. Um, so back to questions and discussion. So Thank you very to... much, Sean and Jess will lead us in our questions and answers. Thank you. Sean, thank you so much. That was fantastic um, and so much food for thought as well. And a lot of the things that you've been saying there um, are certainly things that we've been thinking about at the very start of this community of practice, especially the many different voices as we're saying that, just including everybody. And that's why we're having our launch today. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can pop your hand up or Put it in the chat, whichever you prefer, whichever you're more comfortable with. Um, oh, there's a question already. Uh, Patrick Fitzgerald. Uh, hi, Sean. Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm just sort of curious about um, obviously making students sort of expert learners is an important part of UDL. Um, I'm kind of curious about like how would you how would we sort of provide resources for students to kind of get them to like become expert learners so how would you get them to for example kind of realize what well, you know i'm better at you know writing stuff down or making graphs or maybe you know i absorb information better by listening or by watching videos or sort of by kinesthetic learning because like people can you know might have a multitude of like learning stuff different ways um, is there any kind of resources we could put in place, I guess, sort of higher ed tech administrators and lecturers to kind of guide them and kind of let them do that sort of work themselves? I, I, that's a really interesting question, Patrick. Thanks a lot for that. And um, I, I think what I'm going to do is to hit that from two different uh, directions, if you like. One of them is the one of them is the learning space, um, which you're really putting us into. You're putting us directly in that space of learning right now. Um, and one of the things that I find is particularly helpful, helpful is to, to flip assessment into the learning space because there's nothing quite focusing like focusing on what we expect our learners to know and to evidence. Um, then so incorporating a focus on assessment within the learning space and getting the students to peer assess their work and to think about the strategies that are involved in peer assessment, both in terms of their own engagement in that process, have coming to 
the site with samples of work as to what it is that has worked effectively for them, mm. learning from their peers, and then uh, taking that learning to to inform their future assessment work. So I think I think the f- a focus on assessment. Well, it's a it's a it's a it's a, p- it's a particular area that I quite enjoy. So you're you're asking me to sort of just shout about kind of maybe some of the areas that I quite enjoy. But I think that that attribute of reflection in the learning space is really, really helpful, um, particularly group collaborative and peer work. But maybe to take that up a meta level, how, how do we know what what it, I, your question could be a really good research question. So yeah. do we know the answers to that? Um, possibly not. But but perhaps by engaging learners in the research process, we can formulate some of the the answers to that. So I think um, by involving learners in that community of practice um, and encouraging them to become active co-researchers with academics, with learning technologists, (coughs) with library and information specialists, with student services, through, for example, a, a strategy like lesson study will provide you with those answers over time. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much. Sorry, I was muted there, <laughs> turning away. Um, so one of the things, Sean, that we're very interested in doing. Oh, sorry, it's a question from Thomas there before I get going on resources. You're muted there, Thomas. One of the things that's come up there recently was about, you know, not just community to practice within our Within our H, uh, within our university, but in kind of inter collaboration HEIs, and the one thing I know because you have a clue and it's kind of international. I was wondering, for us, what if we were to go down that route of more inter HEI communities of practice? What advice have you for us? I guess in terms of your experience of having set up include and maybe how that could guide us and how we could approach that topic. I th- I think that's a, again a really good question, Thomas, and I was thinking about that just in preparation for for today. Um, I think it's helpful to perhaps over time see where your see where the community of practice leads you in terms of what are some of the critical um, considerations that are emerging within the community of practice. So for example, um, working with colleagues at the University of Ibn Zor in Morocco, it became clear that for, to me that they were really motivated by uh, a focus on on learner voice and learner inclusion. And it was something that perhaps hadn't been uh, a significant focus within North Africa um, and within Morocco previously. So for them, that's a particular area that to some extent that they have developed an, an area of expertise about. Um, there are others uh, working with uh, University UNISA in Brazil, for example, who uh, whose whose strengths are in the areas of of learning technologies and um, gamification, for example. So I think it's it it might emerge that you have a particular specialism. I think that that comes about over time. Now, that's not to exclude the other areas that are going to be vitally important. But I think it's helpful if if it's not so much a and I, I don't want to use any pejorative uh, words here uh, like scattergun. It will be a scattergun kind of approach. But just seeing what your strengths are as a community and and then pitching those forward. I think that's that's perhaps something that we've been thinking about as a as a wider a collaboratory as well as part of include is is how can we kind of ensure that other groups take on more responsibility for particular areas of learning. And as I mentioned, I think it will be helpful over time to to see what emerges within your community of practice. It could be around assessment, for example. I know that's a very strong area in University College Dublin, the whole area around universal design and um, and assessment. So see what emerges, um, perhaps not, not forcing that issue um, and just seeing where the expertise develops over time. Give it about 
12 to 18 months. And I think by then you'll have a sense as to kind of what your key um, contributions might be uh, more internationally. Thanks, Sean. Oh, and I, I'd encourage you just in light of that as well is to just keep an open mind with um, calls for research projects that emerge. And um, sometimes you have to follow the money on these things too. Did I just say that? Am I monetizing the whole UDL thing? Um, Sean, we have a question from Lydia Bracken, uh, no relation to you. <laughs> Hi, Sean, thanks very much for uh, your presentation. And I think, you know, it, it's brilliant that we have this community of practice and it's brought so many people together who are interested in UDL and inclusive learning practice. So my question is whether you might have any advice for how we um, bring in people who maybe aren't aware of UDL or who are not currently engaging in that type of practice into our community um, and kind of encourage them to adopt similar principles in their teaching. Um. Be loud and proud about what you do. I think that's, you know, just uh, amplify what you're doing. Get it out, get the message out by multiple, multiple means. And um, and maybe perhaps engage with some people that are, you know, in terms of presentations, uh, seminar presentations, etc. Maybe pull in some of those people who may not necessarily have the, the stage. Um, a lot of the time and and also I think in terms of sustainability um, keep things regular so that so that there are opportunities for people to you, you're nodding away like yes we've thought about that one already <laughs> but but keep them regular keep them uh, keep people interested and just keep that message going out consistently I think that's uh, that's how you can engage people I've noticed that Tracy had identified that the students union are really valuable and I would um, second that as well. Just getting your student union involved um, uh, from a diversity of different perspectives. There, there may be uh, representatives from different attributes of diversity and, and providing them with, with scope to, to engage as well is, is helpful. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Thanks, John. As part of our being loud and proud, uh, we have, well, it's a very new website with a, a collection of resources that we're creating. Um, and I'm just going to pop the link there into the chat again in case anybody didn't get that before. But it's going to be, it's, it's a growing list of resources. But um, one of the things that we're really interested in is getting people looking at theory into practice. So say the plus one approach um, and, and how people have actually used um, UDL within their own teaching. So we have a section on that on our website there. Um, and I just I know that there are these kind of case studies around, you know, around the world, really, you know. So um, is there a, a place in include that that we can look at the case studies? Yeah, there are uh, mm -hmm. case studies that are available and particularly I think from the presentations that have taken place uh, from various colleagues at different universities. Um, and uh, Tracy uh, Galvin, who I think will be presenting at some other UL um, event shortly, mm -hmm. is, um, is, is part of the group that organizes CPD, uh, Continuous Professional Development. Uh, within the community of practice. And I think that provides kind of really fabulous insights as to from across the globe as to what colleagues are doing to uh, to impact within their own universities and beyond their own universities. Fantastic. And just as yeah. you mentioned there, uh, so Tracy's going to be talking um, I, for you well on the 3rd of December, and I'm going to put the link for that into the Excellent. chat as well so people can register and sign up. So that's been organised by, by Lydia Bracken. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we had noticed that um, there are there lots of pockets of UDL around and we actually have uh, 78 members of UL ah. to undertaken the national, uh, the, the digital badge in UDL Excellent. this year. So there's there's definitely kind of a growing momentum there. So we're just kind of pull everyone together so that you know that we can really you know show what off what we're doing because there's already so much work being done in UDL around the university. Um, and one more thing, one more link that I'm going to put into the chat there is we have just a very short anonymous survey, um, and this is just looking for um, as a member of our community of practice, 
things like you were saying about how often we'll meet and what types of events we'll have and any in particular any um in um areas of interest that people have so i'm going to put the link into the survey there as well so it'll be really interesting to see how we um what people come back with because we really want this to be an actual community for people to really have an input no matter what their level of udl is you know right um so is there any more questions from anybody i am i don't think i see anybody there so what I might do is just, um, Angelica, if you're here, we could um, round up with the, because this has been um, funded by the National Forum Vital um, Funding, and I think they have some goodies for us. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks a million for your presentation, Sean, and uh, for all the questions that came through today. So I really got the most enjoyable uh, part of the day uh, task, which is just a little raffle for goodies to, to give away to everyone that registered for uh, our event today. So delighted to see so many of you uh, attending here. So I am very quickly going to share my screen, if that's OK, with you all. And I hope that you can see that now. Uh, so without further delay, I'm just going to go ahead and spin the wheel. OK, so we have Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make a note of that. Uh, so Caroline will be in touch with you to send you a few goodies uh, and we, we have a few to give away today so we'll, we'll spin the wheel a couple more times. Okay Angela, likewise I hope that we also get some perhaps non-UL uh, colleagues today as well uh, so we can uh, put something on the post to head your direction. Uh, kindly sponsored by uh, the Vital Week uh, by the National Forum. And uh, William. So anyway, uh, just a little bit of uh, fun to finish with the day. So just handing back to you all. Thank you, Angelica. So um, just to wrap up, thank you again, Sean, for giving us so many good thoughts as we move forward with our community of practice. Um, as Jess shared in the chat, um, we very much welcome your feedback on the vision of our community of practice and when and how we meet in the future. Um, you have the link to the next event on December 3rd um, and we very much look forward to engaging with you through the community in the coming months and years ahead. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for those who helped provide the accommodations and we wish you all the very best. Thank you.